under Trump, and I think this is one of the things that Donald Trump has has done that has been very positive, is he dragged the Republican Party away from the kind of Bush Cheney neocon yes. orthodoxy and even like going back to the kind of Cold War of endless wars and stuff by saying like we shouldn't be focusing on all yeah. these other countries. Yes. And some, we should be focused on our own citizens, especially because they're not doing very well by every metric. Yes. Right. Every city is filled with like addicts and communities that are being devastated and falling infrastructure. You compare the infrastructure of the United States, you know, every time I come here. I like come to an airport and see roads and you go to, you know, Asia or like places in the Gulf or, uh, and, and even in Western Europe, you know, you, the difference is so obvious. It looks like it's a crumbling country on every level and we're spending all this money to benefit other countries. So the Republican party has basically rebranded as America first, you know, based on the idea that our primary priority should be the people of our country. You, I can't tell you how many Republican members of Congress or Republican journalists or pundits I've interviewed over the last two and a half years who say we can't be financing the war in Ukraine because we don't have the money to be financing other countries' wars, nor should we be doing that. Our focus should be on our own country. And every single time, well before even October 7th, I would ask them, does that also apply to Israel? And they would kind of stammer and stutter and not want to say it. But now, you know, you say like you don't care about Israel, and I totally understand that. The problem, though, is, is that Israel has received far more aid from the United States than any other country by far over the last three to four decades. We pay for their military. We pay for every time there's a new war, we send them billions and billions of more on top of the $4 billion a year that Obama negotiated with Netanyahu. Not only do that, but we arm them. The bombs that they use to kill Gazan civilians come from the United States. And I think worst of all, we isolate ourselves from the entire rest of the world. Do you know how many votes there have been at the UN over the past seven months where the entire world is on one side and Israel and the United States stand alone on the other with you know a couple of those tiny little countries that we often bribe like Micronesia and Marshall Islands, the part of the coalition of the it's world. It's literally called that? Micronesia. Yeah, exactly. Micro. It's like, a, so, you know, it's also just the standing in the world, like our sacrificing of soft power. So we give up so much for Israel in so many other ways that if you're an American citizen, you have to care about it, even if you don't want to. You know, when I one of the stories we well, did- what I meant was, I don't, I feel emotional. Like I just have like gut level affection for because I've had such a nice time there and I'm, I like so many Israelis personally and know a lot. And I just like, there's nothing more wonderful than having dinner in Jerusalem on a summer night. It's just, I, so I have a lot of affection. I guess that's what I'm saying. So I'm not sort of animated by- you know, any, anything really. I'm just like trying to, I live here. So do my kids. So did my ancestors. It's like, I just care about this country. And if you're changing my life or stripping my rights from me that we've had for 250 years on behalf of any other place, you are my enemy. Like, it's just that simple. You are my enemy. I mean, I don't know what to say. I don't want even to even have this conversation. Well, that's the amazing thing is that the devotion to Israel is so great and so incomparable the devotion of any other foreign country that it's to the point that their supporters, supporters of Israel, are willing to deconstruct and erode and sacrifice the core basic rights that as Americans, by definition, we're supposed to enjoy. See, I won't to, accept in that. Of that I other won't country. accept but that. But that is what's happening. This is my country. I'm from here. I'm going to die here. I will not accept that. And I don't care what you call me. You can't take away my right to say what I think. That is the foundational right in the United States of America. And it's the only thing that prevents us from becoming, you know, Stalinist, period. Well, well, I remember you and I talked about this on your show, I think three, four weeks, maybe after October 7th, when all these calls for restrictions on speech were starting to emerge. And one of the things you said, which I remember was by some weird inversion or collection of various events, it has been the American right over the last decade that has been defending the cause of free yes. speech which is absolutely true. It's one of the reasons why I've had more alignment with the right than with the left, because that's a primary cause of mine, always has been, always will be. And you said, if the right now starts abandoning that and advocating for censorship, because now the views that are being targeted are no longer ones they love, but ones they hate, namely criticism of Israel, the right will never have credibility ever again to pretend that it believes in free speech. Because you know, if you go to North Korea and you praise the government, you're not going to be bothered at all. You can go to any country, any tyrannical country. If you express the views that people in power want to hear, you're always going to 
enjoy the blessings of free speech. Free speech is for dissidents. Free speech is for people who have opposing views, minority views. And so to watch the right wave the banner of free speech because it was conservative speech being targeted. Everyone will always be in favor of free speech in defense of their own views. The only real task for the authenticity of a free speech advocate is when it comes time to defend free speech for the ideas you hate most, which is why that what the ACLU of did was so course. admirable. I search out on purpose the cases where the views I hate most are being assaulted and censored to defend free speech there because that's the only way you can really defend that value in a meaningful way and defend your country like what does it mean to defend the united states it means to defend the bill of rights the thing that makes this country it's on our market economy it's our system of government is based on the idea that you have rights you were born with that were not conferred to you by government and cannot be taken away by government and that is that's the unique idea that is the idea and if there's any idea worth defending it's that and if that goes away and people who have, you know, more powerful computing power or more money or, you know, access to the levers of of uh, power can use violence in a state sanctioned way. If they can stop you from saying what you think, if they can force you to believe certain things, we're just done. We're done like like that. You're not allowed to wreck my country. Actually, that's how I feel. about well, it. Well, and also, you know, the the we were talking about Snowden earlier. I mean, one of the the real cause that motivated Edward Snowden was not so much the right to privacy. Obviously, that was a big part of yes. opposing the surveillance state. What it really was, was preserving this incredibly new and powerful innovation that had emerged in his adolescence that he became very enamored with, which was the internet. The internet is a remarkable weapon for citizens to communicate with one another, to spread yes. information, to organize without the ability of state and corporate power to intervene and control it. And he saw the degradation of the free internet, which was always the principle. You go back to the mid nineties with the, the proclamations about the importance of the internet it was always a free internet. Keep your hands off the internet. That was the whole point. Yeah. And they degraded it into the, 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 one of the most powerful systems of surveillance ever created. But this cause of free speech really means now mostly free speech on in the place that where we communicate most, which is the internet. And that was why the Biden administration's systemic attempt to force these big tech companies to remove dissent that two separate courts have now concluded were one of the gravest assaults on, on the First Amendment was so offensive to me. But the similar thing, it, it comes from the other direction. And if you take away the right of free speech, it not only means, it doesn't only mean that people who dissent lose the ability to express that dissent without being punished. What it means even more seriously, and I think more destructively that we don't often think about, is that it enables power centers to propagandize without challenge. We drown in a closed system of information that power centers approve of because they've eliminated all these other ideas as disinformation or hate speech or incitement to violence or whatever theories they invent to erode free speech. And then we're we're hopeless. We're totally impotent. Every other right we have doesn't matter because that's the that's our minds are controlled. Our exactly. mind, what we believe is manipulated. So we'll be obedient. We'll be conformist. Those other rights won't be necessary because we'll be good conformist, obedient citizens who don't realize how propagandized we are. And that is the what's at stake. And so when you see any group of people especially ones who claim to be, believe in free speech, suddenly abandon that and start cheering for censorship as a framework, it's incredibly dangerous because even as a self-interested matter, you know that this system will eventually be used against you, even if it's not at the moment. And conservatives of all people should know how easily it will be weaponized against them. And yet they're cheering for the very systems that they've spent a decade now claiming to hate, along with all these scripts about Everyone's a racist who disagrees with me. And um, no, this isn't free speech. This is hate speech, you know, all or, or hate, hate speech hoax, uh, hate, uh, hate crimes hoaxes like Jesse Smollett, hate crimes hoaxes like Barry Weiss's site pushed this idea that there are Jewish students walking around and suddenly being attacked by violent hordes of anti-Semitic mobs and being stabbed in the eye with Palestinian flags. And it all began with this one woman who is a longtime Israel activist who claimed that it happened. And she went all over the media claiming I was stabbed in the eye with a Palestinian flag. There was nothing wrong with her eye. There was nothing wrong with at all because it didn't happen. A Someone waving a flag was walking past her and it brushed by her. And that was a hate crimes hoax. And then Mike Johnson, the Speaker of the House, went two days later 
to the Holocaust Museum and turned that one hate crimes hoax, that this one singular incident and said, we are now a country where Jewish students cannot walk out on the street without being endangered of being stabbed in the eye with a Palestinian flag. So every single component of left-wing culture that the American right has been heaping scorn on and viciously mocking and deriding for a decade are now their defining beliefs and tactics in defense of this foreign country. So Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. We hope you'll subscribe to it. And by the way, you can hit the little bell on there and get notifications every time we produce a video. We hope you'll do that also.